I'm only conscious of, I can even speak without a mic, I'm just conscious of the film. Because uh, I'm, I'm not right, so I'll, I'll stand. Is that okay? All right. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> First of all, Ron, I thank you with all my heart for that incredibly moving presentation. Um, Emma and I had the privilege and honor of uh, visiting Antoine for the first time uh, recently, and um, I found that the bond with you was immediate, and we were two souls in search of justice, and we recognized each other, and, and uh, it was an incredibly moving visit. The most moving <coughs> part of a visit to Amzhuang is to go to the small cemetery where Ron's family are all buried, plus many young people who died way before their time, and to stand in this sacred place and to look around, and it's just what you saw, it's just you're surrounded by the petrochemical industry, and it's, <clears throat> it's a travesty, and yet it is no less sacred for that. It's perhaps more sacred because of what you've maintained, and I thank you. And thank you to Charity, and thank you to all of you, all of the people who put this together. I'm just thrilled to be here. I'm just going to take a few minutes to try to situate us in terms of what we're trying to do here. And I want to start off by reminding us that what we're dealing with here, what Ron just described, what we know about the Great Lakes, and what we know about um, the, the assault and the exploitation of uh, often indigenous um, First Nations communities, but not only, um, certainly our wilderness and all of our waters is not just happening here, but happening around the world. And I don't want to get into this, or you'll never get me stopped, but just to remind us that we do have a global water crisis of very, very serious proportions. We all learned back in about grade six that the world couldn't run out of water, that there was a hydrologic cycle, and it went around and around, and, and you could run the water as long as you wanted, you could dump whatever you wanted into it, it didn't matter because it would all return to us. And we now know that we are displacing, polluting, and mismanaging the world's water so fast that we're actually a planet running out. And if you take a look at the recent reports and studies, it shows that the demand for water in our world is going straight up and the supply is going straight down. In fact, <clears throat> a recent study by the big bottled water industries and the food industry said that by 2030, the demand for water in our world will outstrip supply by 40%, which is an absolutely stunning statistic. And when you think of the human suffering that's already taking place with a child dying somewhere in the global south every three and a half seconds, um, we can only begin to imagine what this might look like um, if we don't reverse um, this trend. Uh, and for the Great Lakes, a study on groundwater taking said that if the groundwater is being pumped around the Great Lakes at the same rate as groundwater is being pumped around the world, the Great Lakes could be bone dry in 80 years. We need to understand the urgency with which of, uh, with what we're dealing with here. We need to understand that it's not just pollution and not just uh, climate change and not just over-extraction and so on, but it's the accumulative effect of uh, serious neglect and exploitation. So we're here today to say that the existing governance system for the Great Lakes and for our watersheds in general is not good enough. It's not sufficient. Governments have basically been failing these sacred waters for many years now. We're also seeing growing exploitation of the Great Lakes. Ron has graphically described <clears throat> the past, but the future looks in many ways worse. I mean, we're looking at on the Canadian side, a five-fold increase in the tar sands, which means more pipeline, more piped bitumen um, to Great Lakes refineries. And there are already 17 refineries on the American side of the Great Lakes refining, so-called refining, great, uh, bitumen from the tar sands. Um, and we're, of course, fighting fracking around the lakes <clears throat> and uh, the, the desire to see pipelines going in, under, and around the Great Lakes as a conduit for um, this energy corridor. Now, this is part of what I call a dueling vision of the Great Lakes. Um, there has been wonderful work done by some governments. Some officials have cared very deeply, certainly many environmental organizations, many community groups, but it has simply not been enough. 
because too many leaders, political leaders, corporate leaders, and so on, see the Great Lakes as a resource for their pleasure, their convenience, and most importantly, their profits. And this has been the story since the, uh, the Great Lakes Seaway, the St. Lawrence Seaway, was opened up. It was opened up for shipping, for <coughs> trade, for the expansion of this area in terms of being an economic uh, powerhouse. And this is part of a global move to commodify the world's water um, in many ways that you will know, but let me just read to you from the vision of, of the future of water from the chief economist of the bank called Citigroup. He says, I expect to see in the near future a massive expansion of investment in the water sector, including the production of fresh clean water from other sources, desalination, purification, storage, shipping and transportation of water. I expect to see pipeline networks that will exceed the capacity of those for oil and gas today. I see fleets of water tankers and storage facilities that will dwarf those we currently have for oil and natural gas. I see new canal systems dug for water transportation, similar in ambition and scale to those currently in progress in China, linking the Yangtze River in the south to the Yellow River in the arid north. Of course, this is the theft of the water that belongs to the rest of Asia. He doesn't mention this. I expect to see a globally integrated market for fresh water within 25 to 30 years. Once the spot markets for water are integrated, future markets and other derivative water-based financial instruments, puts, calls, swaps, both exchange traded and OTC will follow. There will be different grades and types of fresh water, just the way we have light, sweet, and heavy sour crude oil today. Water as an asset class will, in my view, become eventually the single most uh, important physical commodity-based asset class, dwar dwarfing oil, copper, agricultural commodities, and precious metals. Now that's a vision of hell in my opinion, <clears throat> but I can tell you it's being taught in every single business school, except maybe at Notre Dame, <laughs> around the world. <laughs> Thank you, Notre Dame. Uh, and uh, it is uh, being taught to young economists, it's being taught to young political leaders that this is the only way to save water. And so we are in a race against time with this kind of thinking and with the move um, to commodify and continue to exploit um, the world's d dwindling water sources. So what we're doing here today is that we understand the need to move beyond fighting individual fires and we have to move to and create a new path forward that reflects a, a fundamental reorientation in governance of the Great Lakes and in governance of our watersheds generally. So we, the people of the region, must take it upon ourselves to co collectively protect these Great Lakes based on the very principles and practices that inform the first peoples of this region, namely that the Great Lakes must be shared equitably and uh, protected responsibly by all who live on them for seven generations to come. What we're hoping, and this dream has come from many of us talking for a long time, many of us in this room and others who are not here, that we name and recognize the Great Lakes to be a common heritage preserved as a public good for the benefit of all and not just the privileged few. This commons would be protected by the doctrine of public trust, rejecting the view that the primary function of the lakes is to promote the interests of industry and the powerful. A public trust would ensure the lakes are equitably shared, carefully governed for the good of the whole community. And this notion would clarify that private interests are subordinate always to community rights. Under a commons regime, all activity, public and private, would come under strict public oversight and accountability. And it would operate within a mandate whose goals are the restoration <clears throat> and preservation of the watershed, as well as water justice for all and those who live around the lake and I would argue that that includes other species. <clears throat> We're also talking about the need to realign our human laws with those of the laws of nature. Um, there's a manifesto called the De Universal Declaration on the Rights of Mother Earth that a number of us have been involved in. <clears throat> its original author, Cormac Cullinan, who's a, an environmental and human rights lawyer from South Africa, says that one day future generations will look back on how we have treated the earth 
much as we look back and see how, how some people have treated others or used others as slaves. And he compares the way we treat nature and other species um, with slavery. And uh, I think we have to reorient uh, our thinking in, a, in a, a, a most profound way. And we have to do it quickly because we're up against very, very powerful forces who are moving very fast. <clears throat> we desperately need a cohesive and common analysis uh, of the crisis facing the Great Lakes. We need a common narrative to guide us through this journey. We need a common set of, of goals to unite us as, as uh, activists and people who care around the lakes. We need a basin-wide consistent laws, regulations, and definitions to protect and expand existing <coughs> public trust laws. And eventually, we need the supremacy of this framework of, of regulations and laws based on this notion of the commons and public trust to supersede um, the myriad of failed models that we have, remembering that we have two countries, nine states, two provinces, many First Nations communities, many municipalities, um, with different laws, different regulations, most of them not enforced. And it's simply failing the watershed, and we have to think watershed-wide. We need a set of principles that we can come together on, and we need a, a common narrative. And we need to say this as strongly as we can, because Ron and the people of Amjuan cannot fight what they're doing alone, and <clears throat> all the people coming into your community cannot fight this alone. We have to fight this uh, together. Um, my dream, eventually, is a full treaty, um, but that's not where we're starting. We're not starting at the political top. We're not going to governments, <clears throat> although uh, Jim Olson and I did speak to the Joint Commission uh, on, uh, uh, on the, this notion of, um, now what was it, no, no jargon, right, was it, <laughs> it was last night, uh, on the, uh, the, this is the commission that oversees uh, our shared boundary waters between Canada and the United States. And we got, I thought, a very good hearing, um, except from the Canadians we heard afterwards, who are all <laughs> appointed by our very terrible government. But <laughs> in any case, that they were polite. But I did feel that the, the American uh, uh, appointees to this, uh, to the commission, were very open. <clears throat> and I do think that we have a language here and a dream here that people um, are open to and when they hear it it's common sense and they know we need to move forward. <clears throat> but the starting point is not um, with politicians or senior governments but with the communities of people who live on and love these lakes and the need to strengthen their what I call right to care. I have a friend who talks about the right not to know what it's like to be <laughs> living in an area of privilege and not, not to have to know what's happening to the, how many girl babies are born. And I've always thought, what's the, what's the alternative to the right not to know? Well, it's not the right to know, it's the right to care. Mm -hmm. And I think people around the lakes have this care, but they don't know how to walk into it. They say to me, I'm not an expert, I'm not a scientist, I'm not an environmentalist, I don't know how to find my place. What we're trying to build here today, or, and we've been, some of us have been working towards this in very different ways, is to come together to launch a movement where we uh, extend um, the way, the place in to this right to care for all of us who love our watersheds. Uh, we must forge a participatory process commensurate with the challenges of these mighty lakes and the people who uh, live on them and depend on them for life. And it is my sincere hope that this becomes a model around the world. The report that I wrote, the think piece on, um, on the Great Lakes as a public <clears throat> trust and a commons and a protected bioregion was picked up by friends in Australia recently um, who are trying to protect the Murray Darling, which is being uh, destroyed by agribusiness and siphoning up all the water to grow cotton and rice and more recently wine, their wine industry and shipping it all over the world and they're using this as a model and we were thrilled to learn that the Waterkeeper Alliance a few months ago adopted language around the Great Lakes exactly similar to, to the language we're using that it's a commons and a public trust and this is the alliance of all the water keepers um, around the world. So we are, we are beginning a process here today because because we have to, because we've been given the gift to be here on this earth, in this place, at this time. Um, and it is work that has called our name. And 
we must learn to care for each other, to love each other, to support and trust each other, and to build something that's greater than the forces that are trying to destroy our lakes and our watersheds. We have to do this because future generations have every right, every right, the same right that we do, um, to breathe clean air and drink clean water. This is the work that calls our name. And I thank you very much for the privilege of being here. Thank you.